Hello and welcome back to GALS. I am so excited because we have an amazing guest that I'm, I've been so anxious to meet, Jenny Leigh Fleury. Well, Hi there. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I, I gotta tell the viewers, this is, feels really full circle for me because back in 2007, I attended the DigiGirls high tech camp and it's a, it's a Microsoft Youth Spark program and Jenny was a keynote speaker there and she w her speech was just so amazing and so um, it's just so inspirational and it definitely stuck with me and I was, I was like 15 at the time. So it was, it's really, really exciting having Jenny here today. And another thing that was amazing was that she was nine months pregnant when she was on stage and her partner was literally at the back of the auditorium <laughs> ready to take her to the hospital. And so like our whole crowd was like, this woman is so badass, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what he was saying at the time. He, he, uh, he definitely was uh, questioning why I was prioritizing <laughs> uh, DigiGirls um, rather than going to the hospital as I was in actually in labor. Oh but I, um, but I, you know, it all turns out well. I mean, I, I now have a 10 year old uh, baby girl. She's not baby anymore. And yeah. of course I get to see you pursuing a STEM career. So oh, awesome. I'm all up for that. Yeah, oh God, I remember that. Um, I remember the whole crowd was like, oh my God, this woman. <laughs> 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 So bad, and you were very nonchalant about it. I remember you were like, "I'm under a slight time constraint because I have to go to the hospital in like an hour." <laughs> so it was that was very memorable. Another memorable thing was after your talk, you asked people if they had any questions, and we were all like young teenagers at the time, and mm -hmm. so we were all kind of shy, and we didn't um, we didn't really want to speak up, and then. Um, and then I remember there was this girl that must have whispered a question to her friend that she wanted to ask you but wasn't like brave enough to raise her hand and mm -hmm. ask it. And you lip read for her and you and then you're like, oh, that's a great question. And we're like, oh, my gosh, she's like a, she's like a Marvel X-Men. She has like superpowers. <laughs> so it was I just remember that there were so many points in that wow. talk which were like, oh, my God, this woman's awesome. Well, I have no <laughs> memory of that, but, um, but you know, DigiGirls is a really important program. I mean, I, I'm so glad you were part of it because it, you know, we, we need more girls um, going into tech and going into STEM. And I think DigiGirls, I've been such a big fan of. Um, you know, that was 10 years ago. I think I spoke at it uh, for about five years running um, mm -hmm. in that period. And uh, me, my team, and everyone I know is a big supporter of it still. I mean, it's just, uh, it's such a really important thing. It, it was a really fun camp. They yes. pack a lot in a yeah, week. Yeah, do apply, do apply. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll put the, we'll put the yes, links in, the, in the bottom so you can do it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and you are now the Chief Accessibility mm -hmm. Officer here at Microsoft. Yes. And of course, like, this is an amazing role. And you also have a, com a completely different level of being able to empathize and really fully understand the, the importance of this role here at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, things have changed a little in 10 years. So 10 years ago, you know, I've been at the company 13 years and uh, 10 years ago I was the chair. We, well, we just recently formed, I think, the Disability Employee Resource Group. We've had lots of employee groups for people with disabilities, some going back to the 90s. Um, but we just formed that employee resource group, which is all of the people with disabilities at Microsoft um, coming together to really work together uh, to make a better workplace, better technology, drive awareness of disability. Uh, and I think it's kind of full circle in some ways because I think I learned and continue to learn every day from our employees, uh, myself included. You know, I'm profoundly deaf and um, you know, what that experience is to have a disability and how Microsoft can make a difference in that. Um, and then ex pretty much exactly nearly two years ago, um, give or take a couple of weeks, I became the CAO. And my job is really to do exactly that, um, along with a huge gang of us um, uh, across the company that are passionate about this, not just our employees, but people that work on accessibility, which is really making our technology uh, work and be productive and efficient and usable and fantastic uh, for people with disabilities, uh, whether that's Windows, Office, uh, our hiring processes. Um, and you know, so now my day job, my every minute um, is about how we can make stuff better uh, and more empowering for everyone. Absolutely. I want to definitely dig into the, the hiring yeah. process and everything, but I want to rewind way back mm -hmm. because um, what was like when you were a little girl, what, what did you want to do? What did you aspire? Oh my gosh. Um, 
So I was born in the middle of England, in central England, um, about 15 miles from uh, Birmingham. Um, my parents are both teachers. Um, in fact, they were both, uh, they went on to be head teachers or principals here in the US. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they just said, hey, you can do anything you want to be. Um, so I was going to be a musician. And, um, you know, I was going to, I, I don't think I had the rock star thing. I mean, I was definitely into adamant and salt and pepper and all manner of different stuff. But I really wanted to be a classical clarinetist. That was my, that was my, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to be. That's awesome. And I know that you went to um, the University of um, Sheffield yes. and, you, you, and you got your BA in music. Yeah. That's very cool. Now, I feel like a lot of people have this common misconception about Microsoft, like you got to be like hardcore engineer, hardcore <laughs> tech. There's this preconceived notion that you had to be like in a really techie type um, uh, academic program to be able to come to a big company like Microsoft. So tell me about your journey from having a BA in music and then mm -hmm. slowly making your way and becoming the CAO of Microsoft. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, I went on and got a bachelor's of music, came out of music uh, college, and uh, you, know, you just learn a lot yeah. from music. It's not just about uh, learning what Mozart did or uh, Shostakovich or whoever it may be, but it was also about how to perform and um, how to stand on a stage and how to talk and talk about a piece of music, play a piece of music. Uh, and also, there's an incredible amount of math when it comes to, to music and yeah, yeah. a lot of problem solving that comes into it, so particularly when you're sitting in an orchestra and teamwork. Absolutely. So I actually, I attribute a lot of the skills that I use now back to that. Um, but I came, out of, I came out of music school, I needed a job. I moved to London, I was doing some odd gig stuff and um, I was actually doing a lot of music therapy and respite care. I was heavily involved even then in the disability world. Um, but I needed a job that paid like rent money. Um, and so I ended up working on the IT help desk uh, of a newspaper. Oh, wow. And um, I'd never really used a computer and uh, you know, didn't really understand the whole thing. I wrote my dissertation for my music degree on an electronic typewriter. And, uh, but I found very quickly that I absolutely love problem solving. Uh, and it really was math and it was listening to feedback and working with teams and playing with Lotus Notes and Quark and yeah. all manner of stuff back then. And it just got me into, it got me into a completely different space. Um, and I found that I just absolutely adored it. And so I worked on a help desk um, and continued in help desk Ross for, for, for many, many years. Um, not just at the Daily Mirror and, and startup companies and boom and bust years. I'm a bit older than you. Um, and then ultimately ended up uh, at T-Mobile uh, before hitting Microsoft. And when I joined Microsoft, I was a technical support manager for consumer products, things like Hotmail um, over in London. So, I mean, it, it's kind of, I joined the company to be a technical support person. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, like being the CAO now, it's yeah. like you made this. You made it look like um, you made it look easy. So tell me, you talk about um, in some some of the articles I've read. You talk about brick walls and overcoming obstacles. And um, can you like, explain to me some uh, like a, a story or uh, like an example of, of ch a challenge you had to face and how you overcame it? Yeah, you know, I, I think every human um, has brick walls that come up at any time. I, I think for me, a lot of the brick walls that I've definitely faced have been on the, on the back end of, of my deafness and my disability, which I wasn't always as open about as I am now. I used to, you know, and I think I learned this through my music, is that no one really wanted to hire a deaf musician, and I could never really understand why that was. Um, but it's kind of obvious, right? Yeah. So I learned very much to hide that deafness and became very, very good at it. So I you know, didn't really, really harness the strength that comes from owning and self-identifying and saying, this is me, all of me. So I, I've definitely hit a few hurdles over the years. One was um, in my mid twenties, you know, and being asked to take on additional responsibilities, being asked to take on, uh, back then I was managing call centers, which clearly is an ideal role uh, for people uh, who can't hear very well. And, um, but I loved it and uh, I was switch trained and I would go behind the scenes and figure out all the IVR configurations. 
Um, but I was being asked to manage call centers outside of the country when at that time my hearing was declining to the point where I couldn't really use a mobile phone despite my hearing aids, which back then were analog. I'm really older than you. Um, and being asked to do something that I didn't think my physical body, my ears would allow me to do. Um, and so I, I literally just said, hey, I, I went to my boss and said, I can't do this. I need to leave. I, I'm, you've given me something that I think you're trying to make a point. I, I know I'm deaf. I can't do it. I, I need to resign. Um, and he turned around and sort of laughed. And he's uh, actually he's my old boss, and I'm meeting him for breakfast tomorrow. And I haven't seen him since oh, cool. for maybe 15 years. And I'm really excited because he he was a, a turning point for me. He turned around and said, "Stop putting your deafness as a blocker. You are the one doing it. No one else. Let's figure this out. Let's make sure that you're set up for success." And he helped me to figure out the the right technology for me to use, the right training for the people around me, the right configuration of the workspace. Um, he just empowered me to get on it um, and didn't let me get away with the brick wall that honestly I had put up for myself um, in many ways. So no, I, I do think they come up. They come up right even today, right? I, I don't think, um, I think I'll retire and still have brick walls. It sounds like what you were saying about your parents both being teachers as well. You had like a really amazing group of people that were able to like empower you and, and encourage you and everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really think we, whether they're your parents or, yeah. or your manager, I think you've got to have a board of directors. Um, you've got to have people that regardless of scenario, you can call and say, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Help me. Yeah. Um, and uh, help you to think things through. And I've been very, very fortunate to have a really good board of directors. And now, given your role today, you're out there helping other people. So since you're the chief accessibility officer, and you were, um, you were a pioneer in uh, creating a hiring program that trains people with autism. So tell me kind of that, that process here at Microsoft and how you, how you were one of the pioneers coming up with that training. Oh, I'm one of many. But I think, you know, autism's a really interesting space. I look at the demographics of disability all the time. Um, I'm kind of obsessed. And, you know, there's a billion plus people in the world with disabilities. It's one of the biggest growing segments. Um, you look at or something like autism, which was one in 100,000 kids back in the 80s. It's now one in around 64, 66 kids that are, that are um, diagnosed with autism. I mean, the rate has changed that much. It's prevalent. And there's, I'm not going to, yeah. I'm no doctor. I can't give you the science behind the why. But I, what it does mean is that the, this, uh, it authenticates this as a serious part of our society. Um, and I think when you look at the employment statistics, autism has a really high unemployment rate and a really high underemployment rate, um, meaning that there are people doing jobs with, um, you know, that, that are way below their qualifications. And we were looking at how we could increase the number of people with disabilities at Microsoft. We were looking at myself and several others, um, including the sponsor of that disability employee group. We were looking um, to see what we could do because if you have people with disabilities in the fabric of your company, just it's logical. You're going to create better products because that diversity is going to breed into whatever you do, no matter what role they're in. Um, and we looked at autism and saw it was in the plus 80% mark for un underemployment and, and uh, unemployment rate. And that for us said talent, um, the talent that's out there um, and talent with a high level of STEM knowledge that should be in Microsoft and should be in other companies. Um, and so we looked at what the blockers are and the blocker was uh, primarily the interview process. Uh, so we removed it. Um, and so it's not really a, uh, the concept of what we're trying to do um, isn't really rocket science, but it, it's so logical in some ways. Yeah. Um, a person with autism is not going to be able to show up with their incredible talent in, during a standard interview process. Um, so instead, we do it over the course of several days in an academy environment with the help of several NGOs and um, you know, a lot of support and guidance that we get from the community. And, 
Um, so far, it's small, but it's it's uh, it's brought us over 50 hires to Microsoft so far. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's an incredible program. That's got to be like a super rewarding part of your job. What's, what's what are some of the other um, what are some of the other favorite things about your job? Um, I I mean I love I I think that in order to make a company like Microsoft the best when it comes to people with disabilities and provide technology that empowers and ultimately change some of these unemployment rates, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so empower you in the home, in the workplace, um, wherever you are. I, you know, I think we have to look at multiple facets. So um, I love spending time on the innovation. Um, I, I love playing with toys. I think we all do. Yeah, yeah um, it's always good. But I, hacking is a really, I, I'm a uh, full-time, people know I'm full-time in that hack tent. I cancel every meeting on my team. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I just love wallowing and sitting with these teams with their amazing ideas, understanding what they're looking to do, um, you know, making sure they've got the resources they need. Uh, and there were some amazing projects this summer that came out of the hackathon. And we had uh, all up, there are about 150 projects focused on disability uh, this summer and about nearly 850 people hacking on wow. disability projects. So that, that just makes my heart sing. Um, That's fun, amazing. but it also, you know, these are projects that end up things that we launch. Um, you know, seeing AI is a great uh, app for the blind that describes the world. It's a free app on, on the Apple, um, just go to the Apple app. And um, it, it gives you the ability to understand what a barcode is and reads it out loud or Put, take a picture of your face and it will tell you that I've got a beautiful female, <laughs> approximately 25, <laughs> smiling. Um, uh, but also there's, there's many others. I mean, we've got now eye control in Windows that came out of hacking, which is moving Windows, moving your mouse in Windows with your eyes. Um, oh designed for people with ALS, but much bigger um, implications. And learning tools, um, which is in Word. Uh, and OneNote and Edge, but it's an immersive reader aimed for kids with dyslexia, kids with learning disabilities, to help improve reading rates. Yeah. So I, those are you know three of oodles more, but innovation I think is a huge area for us. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. That's kind of fun. That is so cool, mm -hmm. especially with all the yeah the cognitive services and everything. It's been right. it's been really cool to see. And now I, you're you're a very humble person. What's, what's, uh, we want to do like a little humble brag, like what's something at Microsoft that you are like most proud of, that you've been a part of? Oh, good grief. Um, Cause you've done, you've done a lot. And you've, I've, you've I've had a, an amazing career here. Yeah, and I'm still loving every minute of it. Um, you know, I think probably the proudest thing is being part of that employee resource group. I, um, I, I joke um, that I, have learned the most from it, but I also am the biggest stalker of it. I am, uh, the community is made up of 15 different groups here at Microsoft, and I, this is my journey, that's how I started getting into Microsoft, was, uh, and into this area, was I joined the deaf group. And I joined the deaf group because I hit a brick wall while working in the UK and, and in the middle of transferring here to Redmond. Um, and my hearing meant that I, couldn't use hearing aids really anymore. They they didn't really help me much, and um, and I found that people at Microsoft like to talk to one another, which I didn't quite uh, appreciate so much when I joined. I thought that Microsoft would like to email or IM. I thought it would be you know deaf heaven, um, but I I really did find that I needed that help, and the deaf group really gave me so much confidence and so much knowledge of just all the things that I could do to help myself and then empower me to go and ask the right people the right questions and get the support I needed, which ended up with me now you know, using an ASL interpreter. So Belinda, my interpreter, is sitting to your right um, here. But there are 15, 15 of those. Um, and when I joined, there were six. And um, you know, we have a, a conference every year and I remember the first one nearly eight years ago and there were 80 people at it. And our first conference called the Ability Summit, uh, internally, just for people with disabilities, 80 people, and you should have seen me, I was like jumping up and down, so <laughs> excited, thinking that we'd hit it. And then for the last three years, we've had close to 1,000. Oh my God, that's And amazing. I think 
I look at, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. You are never done with a journey of disability inclusion. Um, yeah, there's always a new lens to look at. Um, and, you know, some of the new groups, uh, I was chatting with the leader of our PTSD group this morning, and we need to do more there to have more conversations on PTSD, on traumatic brain injury, on eating disorders, on anxiety, depression, things that are invisible, things that are, do have stigma associated, but are still invaluable skills and invaluable parts of human um, that I want to make sure really feel included uh, as the employee experience and help us to make things better. So I think I'm most proud of being, you know, being a part of that employee group um, and watching it grow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You've been able, because you've had time with the group, you've been able to see the progress and that's, that's yeah. got to be super rewarding to see those yeah. numbers go up and everything. Yeah. Oh, and empowerment yeah. going up and people really going for what they think is important. Absolutely. What now, of course, we're surrounded by really inspirational people throughout you know, our careers and throughout our life. Who's one of your personal heroes? Oh my gosh. Um, I've met some of them recently. And um, you, you, I'm not often lost for words, but I've been dumbstruck recently um, with a few. One is Marley Matlin. Um, now, those who don't know Marley Matlin, she is uh, a female uh, actress. Um, she uh, won an Oscar back in the 80s, um, and uh, Children of the Lesser God was her movie. She's deaf. Uh, she was also in the L Word, West Wing, you know, all manner of things. And I remember watching her as a kid and just like my mouth dropping because, you know, me and my sister both have deafness and have done since we were small children. And just to see a person, uh, a person with deafness achieving her goal, and uh, you know, th there were boundless obstacles she dealt with, and uh, she she just raced through those. Um, Open doors for many of us, and I think um, I think has been phenomenal to watch her. And more recently, actually, in the same uh, same world, I met Mandy Harvey, um, who was a finalist on America's Got Talent, oh, very um, cool. and she she's a, an amazing singer, and I really just. Um, I, I remember watching her first audition with tears pouring down my face. I, but she's also got deafness. She speaks like me. Um, she loves music. And I met her recently and just, there was a meeting of minds as the two of us came together and I, I just did the whole I'm not worthy um, <laughs> thing. And um, you know, I, I can't wait to see what she does because I think she's gonna change the world um, in some ways. And another amazing role model um, for people with deafness around the world. So I think I've had definite role models there that I think um, have been huge inspiration. But then I also, you know, th there's others in the business world, but I, those are the two that I've definitely held up. Uh, now that you mentioned the first one that you mentioned, I've, I've definitely Molly. seen her yeah. in things. Mm -hmm. She is amazing. Oh my gosh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. She phenomenal. And, um, and she's even more amazing in person. I'm very, very lucky to have met her. Oh, in what context did you meet her? Um, I met her a couple of times. She came here to Microsoft oh, and yeah. um, she came here to help us with a launch um, of a program. Um, so we have a support desk for people with disabilities. It's called DAD, Disability okay. Answer Desk. Um, and it's not for people, it, it's, it's for people with disabilities or who use accessible technology. And we took uh, I looked at the statistics actually last night. We, we took 290,000 calls last year um, wow. from customers with disabilities, which makes me so happy. And we launched a deaf channel. We launched it um, in ASL. And uh, so it means that a deaf customer using ASL yeah. can communicate directly with a uh, deaf technical support agent. Cool. And um, so we asked her to come and help us launch this. And so she came in and uh, we did some videos and uh, she came and spoke at our Outside In program and uh, I had, don't think I've laughed harder during the day. We had a great <laughs> time and she, was, she gave us some really good insight you know, on things that matter to her with technology and um, things that she thinks are really important for us to focus on and do more on like captioning and yeah. um, what have you. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Kind of going off that, given your heroes, is there a certain like book or movie that changed your life? Is there? 
or certain oh. or certain piece of media. It could be a television show or what's something that inspired you. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's sorry it's on the same theme, but yeah. I think the most um, the one that really started to change me was uh, again a role model in the deaf world, but a musician again in the deaf world called Evelyn Glennie. That was the one that completely changed um, my path as a kid. Um, and she again just carved a, she's a, an amazing musician, she's Scottish, uh, she's a solo percussionist and the only solo percussionist in the world. And I remember seeing her on TV and we went to a concert and she played flower pots and uh, we asked in advance if it was okay if I could touch the stage. Uh, because music for me is not just an auditory experience, it's a, it's a physical one. Um, and she plays barefoot and um, she, she said, absolutely. So I literally sat at the front with my hand on the stage, oh, just in the bottom, just looking up, but with my hand on the stage so I could feel the vibrations of the music. And I think it taught me to just be yourself. Um, you know, it took me a long while to really live into that. But yeah. um, it, you know, she plays barefoot. When I used to do music, I would often play barefoot as well. Uh, and you know, the the deafness wasn't the conversation for her. It was about the substance of the music. And I yeah. think it taught me to work hard and keep going, and um, you know, make sure that you, in your craft in your craft that you really work to make that something special. So yeah, she was the one that really blew me up as a kid. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that, that music tie, because I was, I was a band nerd in high school. Oh, where you, so what did you play? I played alto saxophone, so another reed instrument. Oh, game on. Uh, yeah, so. Oh, we like, we like single reeds. <laughs> yeah. It's very so, important. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, definitely, the, it's the community there and everything is just fantastic. It really is. It's very cool. Now, um, if you could transport back in time to your young adult self, what advice would you give her? Young adult, um, how young is young adult? I'm, remember, I'm seriously old. Oh, no, you're not serious. <laughs> you know, I, like, so like, I guess like 18, early 20s, yeah, yeah, young, young adult. Um, I would uh, say, don't be so shy. Can you believe that I was quite, quite shy in some places? Um, to continue to be curious, I've always been a curious thing, but um, be vehement in that curiosity. You know, really, if, if you want to know something, chase it down. And um, I do remember spending hours afterwards exploring words that I'd heard during the day and figuring out what they were. And, um, you know, I think that curiosity, is, I could have saved a lot of time by asking um, in the room. I think own all of who I am. Um, I've always been in a lot of rooms uh, where I'm an odd one out. Um, whether that's because I'm British, um, or b very proud of that, um, or because of the deafness, um, but I, I would hold some parts back. Uh, and but the the clear example is the deafness, and I would say don't do that no more. Um, you know, if I if I wanted to repeat anything, I would say own all of who you are and know that that's a good thing. Um, and uh, you know the disability included. Um, so don't repeat my path, right? Um, you know, learn from it. Uh, but no, I just uh, I I, rem I had a lot of fun um, just exploring. A lot of what I did in those those early years were exploring different things, and I think that's really important. Whether it's traveling or uh, you know learning what Lotus Notes was and. Um, you know, exploring it to the depth where I became the Lotus Notes admin because I'd explored it that much. I think that kind of stuff is really important. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you had a, an incredible journey, and you're still you're still doing amazing things here at the company. So it's been really, really cool. You're very kind. I've got a lot more to do. <laughs> well, it's exciting. I'm really now. If you were to tell like a young person about um like if you were to give advice to a young person about someone that might be interested in being in a technology field, what would you, what would you say to them? You can even say it to the camera if you'd like. Oh my gosh. Uh, so if you want to go into a technology field, get on with it. Um, don't wait. Um, get, find something that makes you, makes you curious, that makes you excited. Um, and it doesn't matter. I'm playing with little bits at home with my kid right now. Uh, the little electronic gadgets where you put together and you automate stuff. Um, Lego's really cool. Um, just putting some of those robotics. I mean, just you've got to follow what uh, what makes you what makes your heart rate get up a little bit, um, and uh, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Just keep 
going. Um, you know, and I think that will always happen. I don't know anyone that hasn't been told at some point um, or walked in a room and realized you're the only one. Um, and uh, you know, that can be a cool thing. Uh, you know, get on with it, keep going, um, and never forget to ask for help, I think. So yeah, have fun, have fun with it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm tickled to have you here. I'm so very excited to meet you. I feel well, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, oh, it's, been, it's been a dream to interview you since, since um, seeing you on stage. You're incredibly in kind. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then um, that's another episode of Gals. We had Jenny Lay Flurry with us. We have some significant links in the bottom that you can check out of things she's mentioned throughout the show. And thank you so much.